I'm, I'm certain you know the story. The Hebrew people were slaves in Egypt. Moses and Aaron, through the, pa- through the power and by the love of our Creator God, tell Pharaoh that God wants His people released immediately. Because of Pharaoh's stubbornness, it takes ten plagues to fall on Egypt that kind of culminate with the tenth one, the most powerful one, the death of the firstborn child in Egypt. God wanted His people freed. Have you heard the story? Sure you've heard the story, right? You also know that Egypt was very organized in in how its government ran, in how its education system ran, its sciences. Very organized. It was a well-educated society. They recorded nearly everything and anything. If it was important, good or bad, it went on a cave, on a wall somewhere. It went on papyrus. It went somewhere if it was important, good or bad. Every little detail, it seems. They started using hieroglyphics to kind of remind themselves of maps, where the water was, what the weather patterns had been like. That's why they started using these hieroglyphics, and it just became like social media, the fad of the day for everyone to write everything and anything. And the exit, of course, is a pretty humongous moment in Egyptian history, right? I mean, it's huge. About two million slaves gain their independence and exodus. They leave the country and go back to their homeland. Pharaoh and his armies are are, are defeated. A great expense of life, property, and especially ego for Pharaoh. They lost so much during this time. And like I said, they always shared everything in their recordings, good or bad. So you may assume that we would have a lot of archaeological evidence and hieroglyphic evidence of this Exodus moment. They must have had plenty to talk about. And yet, there's nothing. In Egypt, there's nothing. It's almost like a huge governmental cover-up. Governments don't cover things up, do they? History is full of cover-ups. I don't even need to cover any of the crazy conspiracy theories or the solid conspiracy theories. We just simply know that there's cover-ups. Today in the news was nothing, uh, no theory, no conspiracy, just regular everyday news of a, of a supposed cover-up. I don't know if you heard about the fired professor at Cal State Northridge, just a few hours south of us. He was on a dino dig in Montana, and he discovered one of the largest horns of a triceratops that had ever been discovered. Massive horn of a triceratops. He is a, uh, bio, uh, a, a microscopic uh, biology professor. So he uses the, the microscope, and he took this triceratops horn home, and he got into it and looked under his microscope, and he found soft tissue. Now that, according to the theory of evolution, should be absolutely 100% impossible. There's no way for soft tissue, even in a perfect fossilized form, it cannot last for millions upon millions and millions of years. Now it just so happened that this professor, though he taught at Cal State Northridge, and though he taught as education purposes the theory of evolution, he was a young young earth professor. He believed that the earth was young. It was created by God. He's a Christian. So he shared his findings with his colleagues and with the school, and they told him, you are not allowed to release the findings. The day you release these findings, you will be fired. He asked for a reason. They wouldn't share a reason, but he knew the reason. This was a cover-up. This was proof in a young earth, and then they did not want this out. This was this is what he assumed. He was fired when he released the findings anyway. He said, you know what? I believe in the truth, and the truth shall set us free, and people need to know this, and he released the findings anyway. And he was fired, and he received a settlement from the school after he, uh, he's not an Adventist, but he hired Alan Reinock, a very famous Adventist lawyer with religious liberty. And just this week, uh, the news came down that they had settled with the school. So again, the world is full of cover-ups. And, and soft tissue will you know, kind of go under the carpet, and schools won't teach it, won't offer, 
but there's plenty of proof out there in creation. Now, I've heard some pretty good sermons and presentations about the Exodus, especially one Norma shared with me from uh, the Carter Report. And I realize there's lots of hidden evidence of the Exodus. But in many cases, some of this is circumstantial, but we should see plenty, I mean, just tons and tons of evidence from Egypt of this Exodus. And yet, as I've told you, we see nothing, nothing from their records. Pharaoh must have gone back and erased the whole story as if it never happened. He did everything he could to make sure there wasn't a hieroglyph of anything, nothing, no record whatsoever in any cave. Imagine the undertaking he must have had to do this. He erased their homes from history. The whole bit, it's gone in the archaeological evidence of, of Egypt itself. But there was something he could not erase. There was something so strong by the hands of God that not even Pharaoh in this humongous um, undertaking, not even Pharaoh could have erased. And that's the book you hold in your hands or in your phones, the Bible. The Word of God was preserved. You see, Pharaoh could take care of everything inside of Egypt, but he could not erase the evidence from his enemies because his enemies knew the truth. God himself was Pharaoh's enemy, and God would not allow the truth to be erased. Now, many people kind of point to this. Atheists point to, see the Exodus, it can't be proven. The Bible must be false then. It can't be proven. They look at outside sources to try to prove the Bible. But the Bible tells us how to understand that it's truth. It says, look at the inside sources, which, will, which help us illuminate outside sources, right? Helps us understand when we look at prophecy. History has a cover-up, but sometimes the enemy of those people is where you need to go for the evidence. Just like you can't go to Cal State Northridge now to figure out if there's soft tissue in this triceratops horn. They've covered it up, but where can you go? to this professor on the outside, right? He has it. The university put out a statement during, after the settlement, and they said uh, they want, and they were very clear. They've said it over and over in this statement. Our settlement does not admit that there was soft tissue. It does not admit our wrongs. It does not admit the young earth. Like, they were so clear and make sure everyone has to know if you've heard about soft tissue, you didn't hear about it from us. They want their hands washed of this evidence. But we can find about it anyway. We find out about it anyway. Just like with Egypt, the truth is being buried all around us. This professor who believed in a young earth, he found evidence and he wasn't going to bury it because this evidence glorified Jesus Christ. I wonder how often uh, we bury things that we need to say, things we need to do. We bury the truth. How often we need to not and be like this professor and regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the results, preach the truth anyway. In the Bible, Jesus is called the light. Scripture is called the light. And the church is called the light of the world. Now, how do these three things correlate? How do they work together? Jesus is the great light. We are the light of the world. We reflect the love and the light of Jesus. But it's this book that is the instrument, the medium, if you will, between heaven and earth, between Jesus and the world. Sinners need to know what this book says, and Jesus says it will come through the scripture, through my Christian church, and to the world around them. In the Bible, we are told that the creed that we should follow is sola scriptura, by the Bible alone. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Late in the New Testament, late in the life of Paul, he was getting ready to, to die, and he was writing a letter to his young disciple, Timothy. And he wants Timothy to know that in the midst of darkness, in the midst of the work of Antichrist, there was a rule, a governing foundation we must have. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Thank you, uh, Lovemore, for reading this a few moments ago. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says this important rule about where we get our doctrines, our creeds, or our practices in the church. What is our rule and foundation? 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So the Bible is profitable for a lot of things, right? Profitable. Profitable. Is, is the world looking for profit? They are. They're just not looking for God's prophets, right? But we have got God's prophets, and they are profitable to the world. They can increase our lives and our happiness and our joy. And notice what happens, what the result is of Scripture. Verse 17, that the man or woman of God may be what? Complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you see how strong that wording is? See how strong it is? Complete. How much is complete? Is that 100%? Complete. Thoroughly equipped. How much is thoroughly? Is that, is that 80%? No, completely. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible as our guide, the Bible as our definition of doctrine, creed, and practice. When we stand upon the Word of God, God can complete the work He's begun in the church. This is what took place in a, in a grand scale at the Reformation. When they started to practice these, these, they have five important solas, but the top one was sola scriptura. We are not going to get our tradi- from tradition. We are not going to get them from the writings of our fathers. We're, we're going to stand our principles upon the word of God alone. Genesis to Revelation. This is where we get our direction. Now, it's so profitable and so powerful And God has invited the world to do so. And yet we see very few societies or cultures that have been built upon this principle. I mean, I don't know. If I was going to end up tomorrow on on an island with a group of people, and I, I could take one thing with me, well, according to this, this is the most profitable thing I can take. I'm going to take a Bible and I'm going to build a culture and a society based on the principles of the Bible. Yet we see very few societies that have done this. One of the societies that did is known as the Waldensians or the Waldenses. Now, they were hidden away in the Alps of northern Italy. So they were up in, up in northern Italy. They were still in Italy, but they were far enough removed up in the mountains that they had zero of the influence of pagan Rome or papal Rome. None of that influence. They had the Bible and the Bible alone. And the Waldensians were completely separated from the traditions of men. The Bible was their textbook for everything in life. And I'm not, I'm not over-exaggerating that word everything. The farmers followed the gospel of the Bible. The educators followed the Bible. They used the Bible to teach grammar in school. They used it to teach the sciences. They, I don't know how they did this, but they even used the scriptures to teach math. Probably the book of Numbers. I don't know. But they taught math even through the Bible. In this society, history records a very peaceful people, crimeless, who lived humbly yet happily for hundreds of years, secluded away by themselves, there were villages all around these mountains. They were all part of the Waldensians. Guess how many civil wars they had. Guess how many times Bobio Poleche and Torre Peleche fought amongst each other. Never. Very calm and peaceful people. Their young people were trained in colleges up higher in the mountains. As, in the mountains. as if the towns themselves weren't secluded enough. They took their young people and moved them deeper into the mountains, so the College of the Barbs, to keep them even more separated from the world. 
And that's where they learned Scripture. They would translate Scripture. They would have transcripts of Scripture. They would, all children, to graduate from their schools to become missionaries, all of them had to have the books of Matthew and John memorized and most of the writings of Paul memorized by my, to their mind. Not just written down, but memorized. That's how, once you had that down, you could graduate and move on and become a missionary. So the next time you want to complain about a, a memory verse of one or two verses, <laughs> kids, just think if you had to memorize a whole book. Imagine that. They refused to pay any tariffs or taxes to Rome. They, they, they refused any worship of Rome, any sacred honor due to Rome. And they were immensely hated and persecuted. Rome hated this. The Pope, the Pope ordered them, here's a bull, it states, uh, it orders them a malicious and abominable sect of malignants. And we use that term malignants today to describe forms of cancer. It's kind of what he's getting at. They didn't know cancer, but that's what he's getting at. They are an abominable group of faction of cancerous cells. And the Pope declared in this bull, if they refuse to abjure or to, to, to compromise, to come in, they are to be crushed like venomous snakes. Even when their people were hiding in the mountains from the Roman armies, hundreds and hundreds of soldiers came in to wipe these villages out. But even when their people were running and fleeing into the mountains and literally hiding in caves, they made sure they never left home without their scripture. I've told you before, my grandfather has always, always said before he passed away that if, if the last days happened in his lifetime, as soon as he heard the news of a Sunday law passing, he would walk everywhere with toilet paper in his hand. Because if that angel ever showed up and said, hey, it's time to go to the mountains, he knew he didn't have time to run back for his toilet paper. He'd have it in his hands already. He wasn't going anywhere without some TP. But the Waldensees were like this, but with Scripture. They would carry the Scripture. So as they ran into the mountains and hid in caves, and they would meet by candlelight in the caves, and they would read Scripture. And they were, it's amazing, even in the caves, they were still writing Scripture out. Because they had this faith. If we have, now remember, if you don't know this in history, the Bible was outlawed. So that's why they were writing it in, and transcribing it. They wanted to pass it out quietly in the communities. That's what the missionaries would do. The missionaries actually would take the scripture and hide it in their jackets. They would sew it into their jackets. And then they'd move out to London or Paris or wherever, and they would, they would get to know somebody and talk to somebody. And once they had that relationship and they trusted that they could present the scriptures to them, they would undo the stitching in their jacket, pull out the scriptures, and hand them. Maybe it was the book of Matthew or the book of 2 Timothy. They'd hand them a book of the Bible and say, hey, read this and find Jesus. So even here they were in the hills being hunted down, and they were still writing transcripts of scripture with the faith that God would deliver them and that they could still be missionaries. What a powerful, amazing story. They refused to cover up the truth. Sadly, many of them, though, did not make it out, but they died faithfully. The stories are that as the Roman armies would start fires at the mouth of caves and they'd plug up all the holes in the rocks and that the people inside would slowly suffocate to death, that their last breaths would be singing glory to God in hymns. Here they were out in the mountains, running and separated spiritually from pagan Rome, but being hunted by papal Rome. And they had a dear love for the scriptures. So it's an interesting question to ask then. In papal Europe, if you had a group of people separated from Rome, separated from the traditions of men, separated from the pagan influences and the compromise, if they only had the scriptures, could they settle the argument today as to which day is the Sabbath? Which day would they have kept? As they read scripture, that's all they had was the Bible. Did they meet on the first day or the seventh day? Well, if you were to be in Torre Peleche today, which is their, kind of their capital of their, of their region, 
and you were to ask a resident, a Waldensian today, they would tell you that they have always kept Sunday, the first day of the week, holy. That they never kept Sabbath. But I'm here to tell you today that just like how in Egypt they covered up the truth, the Waldensians have done so today because there's some evidence that they were Sabbath keepers. Plenty of evidence, I should say. You see, there's only one place in the whole entire world for the last hundred or so years where you could read and see that the Waldensians were Sabbath keepers. Have you heard of the book, The Great Controversy, by Ellen White? It's the only place in the world for a long time that has ever stated they kept the Sabbath. And so the Waldensians today actually hate that book. They hate it. And I know that because um, 12 years ago, Sharon and I visited this area, and I may have mentioned this before to you, but we visited that area on a tour called the Great Controversy Tour. So we were going all over Europe and, and learning from this book and Christian history. But when we entered into this town for the weekend, our tour guide told us, put your great controversies away. Keep them in your hotel rooms. Don't carry them around. Because if the locals see that book in your hand, they will take the book or worse. They will persecute you and hate you and call you names and yell at you and maybe even worse. They do not like that book book in this town. In the Adventist church there, man, what a, what a brave man. We got to meet him and talk to him. Just a brave minister there who said, yep, you know what? But one at a time, we're saving souls and, and providing the truth. But it's hard, he said, that work there. The church was constantly being vandalized and persecuted the whole bit. Now, we learned from the Exodus account that Pharaoh tried to wipe the Exodus away. He tried to hide it. And where can we turn to find the evidence? to the enemies of Egypt. He could control all his people, but he could not control his enemies to wipe away the truth. Well, let's do the same with the Waldensians. Did they have an enemy during this time? Yeah, that's Papal Rome. Papal Rome was coming in and wiping them out, killing them by, by the thousands full. Whole villages were wiped out at times. So what does the Roman papacy say about the Waldensians? Well, um, Gerard Domstreet, our church historian at Andrews, recently wrote an article, and he told us about, in the article, he told us about a 13th century inquisitor, so the 1200s, 13th century inquisitor named Moneta of Cremona. His job as an inquisitor was to fight the vile Waldensians. And so before the armies were sent in, his job was to investigate and to decide if they were vile and to find the evidence. Well, uh, Moneta must have been an Italian because instead of just investigating, he started arguing with them. That's Italians. We love to debate. We love to debate. And so he starts debating with them by written letter. Rather than just signing over and saying, yep, the Waldensians need to die and sending it to Rome, he said, you know what, maybe I could convert them. And he started writing letters to them um, and telling them why they were going to be hunted down. He wanted to try to convert them. In a letter specifically he wrote called, The Sabbath is Sunday, he argued with the Waldensians that the seventh day Sabbath was no longer necessary and that the early church had changed the Sabbath to Sunday. So you tell me, if they never kept the Sabbath, as they would claim today, why would he argue with them about which day is the Sabbath? Why would he try to change their minds that Sunday is the Sabbath if they were, according to what we're told today, already keeping Sunday? Does that make sense? No, they were Sabbath keepers at this time, and he was trying to convert them and change their minds and arguing with them that Sunday was the Sabbath. 300 years later, we read from the Catholic historian in, in a book called the, uh, History of the Factions, it says this, quote, the Waldensians do not celebrate the feasts of the Blessed Virgin Mary or the Apostles, except the Lord's Day. Many of them still keep the Sabbath of the Jews. So this was by the time of the Reformation. 300 years later, this, this historian says, many of them still keep 
the Sabbath of the Jews. So while the wall didn't, I'll tell you a little bit in a moment here why they covered it up. But here they covered it up, they hid it, and said, we never kept the Sabbath. But the enemy writing about them, their enemy writing about them, is very clear. They were Sabbath keepers. Now you noticed, 300 years later, during the Reformation, it says, some, except for the Lord's Day. So some of them started to keep the Lord's Day holy. So what happened? Well, by the 1500s, during the Reformation, they were sick and tired of being persecuted. They'd, for 300 years, they'd been almost wiped out and annihilated. So when they heard of Protestants, and they heard that there were other people who were taking up arms and fighting the papal armies, they said, hey, maybe we should get involved in this. And so they actually closed down their colleges and they started sending their young men away to the seminaries in Switzerland and in France. And the young men who didn't get sent were picking up um, arms and fighting the soldiers. So what got in the way? They said, oh, there's another way to fight this battle. They closed their Bible, stopped the work of studying the Bible, and they went to fight in wars. The schools in Switzerland were led by a man named John Calvin. And John Calvin was a staunch believer in that Sunday was the holy day, the Sabbath. And so their young men started to learn in colleges, Sunday is the Sabbath. So they went back to the Waldensian villages. And slowly, as you saw here by that, by that quote, now they had this, well, some of us are meeting on Sundays, some of us are meeting on Sabbaths. And eventually, which day would win out? Eventually, Sunday would win out. And soon they realized that as they allied themselves with the French Re Reformation, the German Reformation, that they had to erase their history. And they went about covering it up as if they never kept the Sabbath. To me, it's almost like a sad reminder of what happens when we feel embarrassed that we've joined or compromised, like we're trying to hide our sin. They knew what the truth was. And, and in the 1500s, they tried to cover it up because they felt guilty of what they were doing. And eventually, they grew a bitter hatred towards the Sabbath. A hatred towards it. It's not how we're supposed to treat it. Let's look at Isaiah 58. We're just about done here. Isaiah 58. Our last verse for this morning. And then something else I want to share with you. But first, our last verse. Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58, verse 13 and 14. While you turn there, we had an evangelistic series last week, last weekend called Pale Horse Rides in Lone Pine. And um, we had a gentleman, a, not a member of our church, who was attending. And, and, he, and he loves the Reformation. He calls himself a primitive Christian. But, but he, he has, he has a, and I, I, I kind of got his story, and I, I don't want to share it here, but he has a, bitter hatred for the Sabbath. Anytime the word is even spoken, you just see him flinch. Like He just has a hatred for the Sabbath. That's not what it's supposed to be about. Even for us, it's not supposed to be a burden. It's supposed to be a wonderful delight. Let's look at this verse, these verses. Isaiah 58, verse 13 and 14. It says here in verse 13, If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath what? A delight. The holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor Him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then, here's the result. Then, you shall delight yourself in who? In the Lord. And I, the Lord, I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. We're supposed to call the day a delight. And it's a day of joy and happiness. And I understand God says, hey, you've got to put your things aside. The things that you want, put them aside and focus on me. And then he makes the promise you're going to feel amazing and rewarded. You're going to be riding on the high hills, which is symbolic of you're on cloud nine. 
Have you heard that term? Riding high on cloud nine, it means you're really incredibly happy. Just put your stuff away, focus on me, and I am going to reward you, and you're going to be so blessed. See, we see this in history. Societies who have the Bible as their foundation, even though they're few, they're so happy. They're joyful. Low crime, low problems. Their homes are happy. Low divorce. I mean, all kinds of wonderful things if the Bible is the foundation of the home. And at its very heart is this wonderful truth of the Sabbath. I realize the world isn't like this. One more thing I want to share with you, then we'll close. Uh, Paul Dosti sent me um, an article um, uh, this week that blew my mind. It was a very large and intricate, very organized survey of uh, the British, people all throughout England. And it asked one basic question. Rank the commandments from most important to least important. Okay, so that was the only question. Then they had to take the Ten Commandments and rank them. Rank them. Number one, most important. Number ten, least important. So this was very intricate. Now, here's what they discovered through this survey. Overwhelmingly, Six of them were very popular. Not just, not just, I mean, there was overwhelmingly people like these six. You know what the six are? The last six. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You know why? Here's my guess. Here's my, here's my guess and as I dive into their brains or the brains of the world. We like these six because they protect us and our property. We like thou shalt not kill. You know why? I, no, I don't like it because I'm, I'm tempted to go kill. I like it because I don't want anyone to kill. Right? I don't want anyone to steal from my house or steal things. I don't want anyone committing adultery. I don't want people lying. I like those six because they protect me. And they protect my family and my church family and my community. Overwhelmingly in England, those six were the most important. I mean, the percentages were far different than the last four. Far ahead. Those six people love those six. And the bottom four were the four that teach us how to love God. Overwhelmingly, these were tiny little numbers, all four of them. And you know why? Because to love God, I have to sacrifice things. I've got to put, I've got to put my life and my culture and my wants and my desires and my sins aside to love God. And people don't want to hear that. People don't want to change that. And of the four... One of them had the smallest little, it was overwhelmingly number 10 across England. You know what that one was? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It, they said it was, I mean, it was literally like 0.01. I mean, it was so small, the percentage. In other words, almost 100% of all surveys put that at number 10, the least important. Why? Because that takes a lot of sacrifice. We've got to put a lot aside. I mean, I'm, I, I, I am, and, and especially when I was younger, a huge football fan. College, this is the day of college football. I love college football. Man, it was hard growing up and trying to train my brain to not even think that way and go that route on Sabbath. The world is not accustomed to a whole day where I can't worry about work. I can't catch up on my emails. I, I, I can't do this. and I can't, I mean, Not that we have those rules per se, but like, in other words, putting all work aside. It's amazing. If you haven't seen it, you've got to check out. There's a, a, a young man who, um, oh, I wish I, I didn't write his name down. This just came to me. There's a young man in Hollywood who's a Seventh-day Adventist. He was invited on the Oprah Winfrey show a year or two ago, and he's talking about um, being an Adventist and being in Hollywood, and he, he starts sharing his, uh, his testimony about the Sabbath and how he doesn't, he, put, he has a work phone. He doesn't care who, he, he mentions some of the biggest names in Hollywood. He goes, I don't care who I'm working for. Will Smith, he says. I was working for Will Smith. I told him day one, you will not be able to reach me from sundown Friday night to sundown on Saturday night. He goes, I don't care what the emergency is. You will not be able to reach me. If you don't want to work with a guy like that, don't hire me. But if you're hiring me, yeah, just know what you're going to get. And she was flabbergasted. Oprah was like, 
What? You, you go into, she goes, Hollywood's a 24-7, 365 business, and you put one day a week aside? He goes, she goes, have you ever lost jobs? He goes, no. Who wouldn't want to hire someone with this kind of morals? You don't see morals in Hollywood. Everyone's going to want to hire a person with this kind of morals. He says, the bur- Sabbath is not a burden to me in my job or in my life. It's a delight. Amen? Amen. Amen. Even in the world of Hollywood, the Sabbath can be a delight. My favorite part is when she goes, wow, I've been raised since I was a little girl thinking Sunday was a Sabbath, but I've learned today that Saturday is the Sabbath, she said. But the world is not built for this culture of putting a day aside. I've got to put football aside and work aside and my errands aside and my, my, my oh my goodness, all these things. Oh. But that's because the world looks at what they have to give up. Adventists are trained and raised to look at the blessings. God does, he is honest. He says, you have to put your things aside. But when you pick up my things, oh, this day is going to be amazing. We can look back in history and see this. This book is such a powerful book. It changes lives. But it starts here. It starts in the churches who read it, who study it, who cherish it. And when people see the the love and the delight we have in our eyes, the joy we have, they'll want to be a part of it too. So pick up your Bibles. Read them more and more and more. These are the last days. I fully believe that. It's time. As Daryl said, now is the acceptable time. Let's study more and more. Let's pray. Father God, we are blessed today to know that, that All of your commandments, all of your word from Genesis to Revelation are a delight and a blessing to our lives. What profit we have seen. Father, we've looked at history and we see the profit in in cultures and people who have kept your word and kept your Sabbath. And then we see what happens as a result when they close your word. Father, I don't want this church. I don't want my life, my family's life, our church family's life. I don't want any of us to ever cast your Bible aside. I don't want us to compromise. I don't want us to to lay it down. I don't want us to close it. I want to lift it up more and more. I want to read it. Lord, we need to memorize it. We need to cherish it. Because it and only it will get us through what we're about to handle. By the Bible alone, through faith in Jesus alone. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I've kept you a little late, but I appreciate your time. We're going to invite Mimi to come up and have our closing song. Stay for potluck. And at 2.30, please watch and share um, Sabbath and 60 number 9.